Hello everyone, welcome to our Novage webinar episode of um, uh, this week. In this episode, enjoy um, this presentation called From 2D Drawing to BIM, 2D Drawing to BIM with Vectorworks. Many users have a 2D only philosophy to drawing in Vectorworks architect, but this is a slow way to draw and it is also prone to errors. There is no doubt in Jonathan Pickup's mind that using a building information modeling workflow is by far the most productive way of creating drawings. As you will learn from this webinar, there are several speed advantages in building the 3D model. Uh, for um, more than 15 years. Yeah. His company, Arconcad, is the premier provider of third-party manuals and training resources for Vectorworks. He also runs the Vectorworks online user group and provides its main direction. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Noveg. Noveg is one of the largest uh, stores online for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. If you look at our the number of brands and products, you, you'll be like, oh, this is Christmas. And for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Coming up next week, V-Ray for Modo, introducing V-Ray's rendering power to Modo's signature workflow. Last but not least, today's webinar is being recorded live, so if you want to rewatch it, um, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channels. And now I'll stop talking and start showing Jonathan's screen. That's what you're all here for, so take it away, Jonathan. Thank you, Barbara. So I apologize to everyone who uh, didn't didn't manage to come back or, you know, the people that came and I was late, I'm just terribly sorry, so, yeah, I felt terrible about it. So today we want to talk about the difference between drawing something simple, I'm going to use a really simple concept, so drawing something simple in 2D or modelling it in 3D, because one of the things that lots of people say to me is, oh, I'll get 2D under my belt first and, and then I'll think about 3D, and, that, and it's almost as if 3D is some kind of luxury. And I wanted people to know that um, there's a, a danger in not using the 3D changes or not using the 3D or the BIM workflow that we've got. So let's have a look at this little example here. So we've got this little example. It doesn't take very long to draw in 2D, except if we use um, Vectorworks as objects, of course, it's much easier to draw a window and a door because we can use those objects anyway. So if I model that in 3D, I can create a model of my uh, little wall. I can put my door and window and I can put the window tag numbers on. And those tags will turn up in plan, so I can create a viewport in plan. I can create an elevation viewport. And it might take me slightly longer to do that than if someone was just doing 2D only. Because lots of people are very quick at 2D and I get lots of comments from people, well, you know, Jonathan, it takes too long to draw the walls, it takes too long to draw the foundations, I can just, I can just draw that in 2D. Okay, well maybe you're quicker than I am and you can draw the 2D quicker. However, what if the client changes something? And we all know that clients change stuff all the time. Not always their fault, there's other reasons for making changes, but if there is a change in the project, all I need to do is to move my door and window update my viewports and my work is done. Now if you did the first one where you drew it by hand, do the, did the 2D version, then you virtually have to redraw the entire thing. The door's swinging the different way, the window's in a different location, and you've got to redraw the elevation. So at this point, I'm ahead, because I, I did it so much quicker than a 2D method. And what if you're doing landscape? Same principle. If we do landscape and we model it in 3D, any changes automatically flow through to the plans, sections, and elevations. So in this project, just in order to sort of simplify everything, I'm going to use this as a concept. I'm going to draw this little garden area. It's going to have footings. It's going to have a little short wall. It's going to have rafters on it. And the idea that I'd like to bring through is that while this is a simple project, it has lots of the techniques that we would use on a larger, mainly architectural project. So I hope everyone's happy about that. Um, 
uh, you're not here to mark my sketches, it was just a really quick sketch to um, show you what we were going to do. Now I've already set up the file, if there are any questions Barbara where someone wants me to go through setting up my file, I can go through it, but I've done the page setup, I've done my grid and I've done my scale. Now it's time to look at my layers and this is a really important part of the whole BIM process, getting the layers and the layer elevations the way we want. Now I'm going to be using Vectorworks Architect and Vectorworks Architect has a concept called stories and levels and I'm going to use the stories and levels to control parts of my project. Now some objects like walls, columns, I can use the stories and the levels to automatically control the bottom and the top, they call it the bottom and the top bounding of my walls, my foundation walls, my slabs and my columns. I can't yet use that to control the elevation of my beams. Maybe in the future, who knows, but right now we, we can't do it. So I'm going to use these stories and these stories are going to make some sense I hope to everybody. So I'm going to get underway with creating those. So if there are any questions about creating stories, let me know. I'm just going to move the sketch out of the way so I can start. Okay, no questions so far. Good. So let's look at our design layers and we're going to create a story. So we're going to create a new story. We only need one story for this and I, I look at my sketch. Let me just bring my sketch back in. So when we look at my sketch and we look at the stories that I've got here, there doesn't seem to be any relationship between the stories that I'm thinking of, underside of footings, underside of foundations, top of wall, underside of beams, those names don't seem to come up over here. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use our default story levels and we're going to edit them and the reason we're editing our defaults rather than just changing them here is that if it was a multi-story building, if you didn't edit the defaults when you went to the next story above, you would not have all the levels that you want. So it's easier if you edit the default story levels. So do we need a ceiling? No, don't need one of those. Uh, do we need a finished floor? Yes, we do, but I don't want it to be a finished floor. I want it to just have all my walls in it, but I can't really think of another name for it, so I'll leave it as finished floor. Jonathan, um, somebody's asking stories as in levels, right? That's what you mean by stories? No, there are stories and levels. Uh -huh. So levels control the elevation of the project. Okay, so what I think I'll do is um, I'll look for another manual which might have con talked about stories and levels. I did one recently, I'm just trying to think what it might be. This one. Uh, maybe not that one. Yeah, I did one recently where I went through stories, levels, um, maybe it was the Inagos one. No, I've, 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 no, I've done one. Does, does anyone remember which one, I, which one I've done? Uh, but I did do one where I, I did a really good sketch for stories. Oh, I know where it is. Okay, it's in my sketchy program, sorry. Um, so don't look at that one. Don't look at all my sketches. I'm looking for Vectorworks. Oh, we love the sketches. Oh, good. Um, uh, here it is. Okay. So this is the one I was looking for. Okay. So the concept of stories is that the story is like the entire story of a building. So in this case, you might notice I've got the footings, I've got the slab, I've got the walls, right, and I've got the floor structure for the floor above. So it's the entire structure of that part of the building. That's the story. Inside stories, we've got design layers. And design layers are the, the, um, the containers of the information. So foundations might include the slab, the slab, the foundation wall, and the footings, for example. The floor one might include everything related to floor one. The furniture, the fixtures, the electrical, the walls, doors and windows, 
even the floor structure for the floor above might be in floor one. And the reason it might be in floor one is because we can automatically connect slabs to walls since the walls of floor one are supporting the floor or the slab of floor two, it's easier to connect them that way. So Barbara, is this answering the question of the person about stories and layers? I think so. Um, okay, yeah. so a, a level is, yes. a story is not a level, a story is a completely separate concept and it's like a group of design layers. Then we've got design layers inside that and finally we've got something to control the elevation of objects and these are called levels. Okay. Cool. So, when it comes time to, to actually build our footings, we can create levels called bottom of footing, bottom of foundation, bottom of cladding, skirting. We can create actual levels that control parts of our building. Might be that we control the ceiling, the uh, top of the, the the top of the wall, maybe the underside of the roof. So I'm going to use these level names as part of this. So top of structure, what does that mean? Who knows? So let's edit that and we'll call it top of wall. Top of wall. And the top of the wall is going to have an elevation of, I think, 16 inches. I haven't changed my units yet, so I'll have to change my units back in this. I'll have to change my units. Uh, yes. Okay, and I'll change my units. So file, units, and I'll change my units back to imperial. Feet and inches, square feet, cubic yards. Okay. So back to my stories. Back to this and back to editing my defaults. So I'll just bring this back so that everyone knows what I'm thinking of. So top of wall, that's going to be the top of my foundation, uh, the top of my little screen wall or the, the structure of the, that. I'm going to edit this one. I'm going to have this one. This is the top of my screen wall. So we're going to have a new level type because I've got two sorts of walls. Top of screen wall. And the top of that screen wall is going to be, I just need to go back to my design and check it. Uh, that's going to be about six feet. Six foot six. 6.5 feet, that's going to be top of my screen wall, top of wall, top of screen wall, do we need one for the structure, perhaps we've got top of the wall, but I'd like to create these ones for the footings as well. So we've got the finished floor, bottom of structure, I don't like that name either, it doesn't make sense to me. It's, when I say I don't like the name, I don't mean that there's something wrong with the name, it's just, to, to me it's just not clear, it doesn't tell me in detail what that thing is for. But I think if I call this bottom of footing, it's a lot clearer to me. I could pick this up months later and know what this related to. So this is uh, minus 36 inches. And I've got bottom of footing. Foundation, I'm going to edit that one as well. It's not going to create its own design layer. Maybe it could. Maybe it should. Let's make its own design layer. And its elevation is zero. It's going to create a layer called foundation. And the scale of that, I think I've got all my scales at 1 to 50, which might be OK. Finish floor, foundation I've got. Uh, top of wall is not going to create that. What's missing? So I've got my roof, don't need roof. Oh, that's a roof layer. Oh, let's edit that one. It's not going to create a roof. It's not going to create anything. So I've got a bottom of structure. I'm not sure what that's for. Let's delete it. I don't know what a ledge is for, so I'll delete that as well. 
So I have a bottom of footing, I need a top of footing, that's what I need. So I need something to control my top of footing, it's a new level type, top of my footing. And the top of the footing is going to be minus 36 inches, but I want my footing to be about, um, about 12 inches. So, well that's 24 isn't it, so minus 24 inches. So now I've got a, a, a system that where I can build walls that will automatically snap to these parts. So I've got a finished floor of zero, I've got a foundation, let's just check that. The layer wall height, I need to check the elevation that I gave it, um, 22, 7 feet 4 inches, 7 feet 4. So everyone all right with that? No questions about that so far, Barbara? No, it's all good. Should, it's all good. This will generate a whole bunch of questions. No. Okay, no, so yeah. I don't want that, don't want that, don't want that. So I need a bottom of footing, top of footing. I need a finished floor. I need a top of structure. Let's go back to those edit, let's edit those ones. I thought I got rid of some of those. Okay, so I don't need a top of structure there. I need the top of the screen wall, top of that, foundation, finished floor, and let's go OK. Now if I, have, if I need extra levels, I'm going to go and create them. So what's the next thing we need to do? We've done our layer setup. Let's just move that out of the way. Click OK there. We've done our layer setup. We're going to work on floor one. Maybe we need to change that layer scale and make it 1 to 25 because it's a small project we're building. And the other layer, the foundation layer, make that the same. I could have just ticked all layers. That would have been a quick way to do it. And the other thing you might notice is that my foundation is above my floor. I can just drag that number down, drag it by the number, and rearrange them. So I guess it's time for us to draw our walls. So when we draw our walls, we're going to draw a wall in structural concept, it looks like this. We're going to have that uh, foundation wall there. Maybe that's going to be a slab that comes right across, and we've got this wall to draw here. And I'm going to draw simple walls. I'm not going to go to a lot of complex detail in terms of the construction of the wall and making um, making too much, uh, too many components in my wall styles. But I think it's a good idea to use walls and create wall styles. So I'm going to create a wall that's about eight inches thick. This is a, just a simple concrete block wall. But the important part is the insertion options here. Because if I say the top bounding of my wall is the top of wall, and the bottom bound is my layer elevation, Vectorworks will automatically figure out where they are and will draw them to the correct height. I could put textures on them as well if I wanted. I could choose a, a CMU texture. I'm not going to because it, it does tend to show up in my uh, elevations. And if I wanted to, I could fill in the data about this. So I could fill in what it is, what it's made of, what kind of insulation it's got, or what sort of steel it's got in the wall. And then I could create a report some other time and report all of that information. So I'm just going to call this the low wall. OK. So now what I can do is I can draw that, that shape. I can draw my building. So I think my building needs to be, I'm struggling to think in imperial terms, but because um, the, the room, it needs to be sort of room size. So it's going to be like 12 feet deep and, and maybe 16 feet long. So I'm going to draw here, and I could draw it this way, drawing each wall individually. Or I could do a quicker method and draw it in a rectangular way and say that that's 12 feet that way and minus 16 feet that way. Or maybe I've got it the wrong way around. 16 feet that way and minus 12 feet that way. Enter once, enter again, and I'll draw my building. Now that is a really quick way to draw. And you'll notice that my walls have already got that 16-inch um, height. So if I've made a mistake and I go back to my layers, and I go back to my stories, 
and I check my stories and say, well, actually, the top of the wall is a bit low. We need to edit that level. How about we make that level 24 inches high? OK, make sure it's the 24 inch one. Click OK and OK again. And you'll notice my walls have automatically changed. Now, if I put a column on top of this, on top of these walls, I can also make the columns bound to those levels. And when I change the columns, they will change automatically as well, which I think is really powerful. Now, just to make sure, I'm going to draw a line across the front here because I'm going to delete some of those walls because I don't really need them. But before I do, I'm going to copy them. Copy. So I want to delete that wall there. But you notice that these walls are ended up being just a little bit short, so I'm just going to stretch those down so they line up with that. And the reason I did that is so that when I draw my foundations, I'm going to go paste in place, which is over here. So did that not paste? I must not copy them. Oh. All right, so I'll copy those. Next layer down, paste in place, OK. So I've got my walls, and I want to now make a foundation wall. So let's go back to my wall tool, let's go back to my preferences, and what I need is a couple of different walls. So I need one which is a foundation wall, so again it's going to be 8 inches, but the insertion options, the top of the wall, is now going to be my layer elevation. And the bottom of bounding of my wall is going to be the top of my footing. Let's save that. Foundation wall. So Barbara, has anyone got any questions yet? No, oh, Jonathan. Everybody's okay. happy with, yeah. Sweet. Okay, so I've got those three walls. They are a low wall. I'm going to replace them with my foundation wall. Since they've got the same width, I'm going to line them up. I can line up their center with their center. And so now I've converted those into foundation walls. Now really I need another wall across here. So I'm going to draw a wall from this corner here. Just checking which side I'm drawing. I'll probably draw it from that side across to there. And I'm still drawing in my rectangular mode, so better turn that off. So I've got walls above, and I've got my foundation walls below. So if I select all of those walls, and I go control click, it should duplicate those walls for me. And now I can set those walls, and I could, I could change their style to an unstyled wall. Up here I could go. Un uh, convert to an unstyled wall, and I could say that their top bounding is the top of the footing, the bottom bounding is the bottom of the footing, and the width is 12 inches. Now it's better if I use a series of layers and a series of classes to control the graphic style. I haven't created those yet, but if people want to see me do that, I'll certainly do that. So now back to our layers. I want to hide my foundation layer. I want to make my floor active. Of course, a lot of that is so much easier if I just use my navigation palette. I can make that visible and visible. I can snap to other layers. I can, I can do those parts. So I've got that. That's part of my design. Now I need to put some columns on top. So we've created levels to control all of this. So I can use my column tool. I can look at my preferences for my column. It's going to be a skinny little column. It's only going to be six inches wide. But the height is going to be the top of my structure. Now, I should have set a structure for this or a layer wall height. I think I set it seven feet, four inches. That's the underside of my beams. I could create a level for these as well. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, they don't they won't control the beams themselves, but it would have been quite handy to have a, a level for that. Top offset zero, 
the bottom bound is the top of my wall. So we've got an architectural wall, it's shaft width is six inches, shaft depth six inches, it's got no capital, no base. So that should give me a simple little column and I can then find the center of that wall, double click, and you might notice that the column shrunk once it got to find out where the wall was. Now I'm going to mirror that using my mirror duplicate mode. So I'm going to mirror that one there. I'm going to use my selection tool to select them both. And now I've mirrored all of those. So now if I change my levels, back to my story, story one. So we think that the top of the screen wall, and six foot six, that's fine. The top of this wall, we want to change that back to there. Click OK, click OK, and you'll notice that both the columns and the, the low wall both changed at the same time. So that's quite powerful. If we created elevations for this project or sections for this project, they would change automatically. So in the handout, I create the drawings a lot later. But if you want, I'll, I'll make them earlier and we can see how we can make the changes and they'll update the drawings. So what do we need? We need some more walls, I think. I think I need some screen walls. So let's go back to my wall tool. We're going to create a screen wall. The screen wall is going to go from, it's only going to be about two inches thick. It's going to go from the bottom bound is the top of the wall, and the top bound is the top of the screen wall. We could put a texture on here. If we haven't got a texture, I can find one. I'm going to make something. It's going to look a little bit like um, I want to. I want a texture that looks like this, like it's this insulation fill. But I want to make it sort of semi-transparent. So I'll edit edit that later. Remember, fill in the data. Let's save this and call it screen wall. And now I can start drawing it. So I should be able to draw my screen wall from that corner down to there, but it's probably easier if I do it in plan view. I'll be able to see exactly where I'm going, because I want to go from that corner to that column there. Now, I don't know if anyone noticed, but my wall turned red, the wall underneath, because my auto join is turned on. So for this case, if you want to draw one wall on top of the other, turn off auto join, it'll make it so much easier. So from that end point down to there, and this one from there to there. And this one, of course, I can mirror. Jonathan, what kind of view are you in? I'm in a top view, okay. a top plan view. That was one of the questions. And, he, and here I'm in an isometric view. Now, when I render it, you don't see it so well until I go back to render and I go uh, by component and let's make the left side. So Jonathan, sorry to interrupt you, but before, what view um, were you in before and the mirror tool works in the axonmetric view? It certainly does, isometric view, okay. yeah, it works fine. Okay. So I need to do that to all my walls so that they've all got the same fill both sides because it's the um, it's only gone through the middle part of that at the moment. Right, left, and I should be able to go um, yeah here. Let's choose that one. Now that texture doesn't look like it's very see-through, so I'm going to click here, I'll click right there. I'm going to edit that texture, and I'm going to change the transparency to a plain transparency and make it semi-transparent, maybe 50%, 45%. That's a bit too much, isn't it? And OK. Now, what's wrong with that? Very high shadows. Well, we should be seeing a, a, a fill through these. 
but it's not doing that. But you can see it's semi-transparent now. It's really hoping for a lovely green color through there. I'm just going to check my notes to see what I'm supposed to be up to. I've done my columns, I've done my walls, done my foundations. Now let's make some roof frame. Um, so the, the question about the mirror tool working in, in isometric view, it will even work in a perspective view if you want. And when you're working in Vectorworks, one of the things you can do is to say, when I change from a 2D plan view to an, a 3D view, I want it to render in OpenGL and I want it to be in perspective. So when I change back, when I change back to a perspective or to a, an isometric view, notice it's become a perspective and it's rendered. If I selected the columns, I could assign a texture to those and make them look more like timber. I think I've got a beach texture I often use. And now I'm going to create a wall on top. I'm going to use the framing tool. I'm in landmark at the moment, so I'll change to a, I've got the landmark framing, for me the framing members in the landmark workspace, but some people uh, note that it doesn't, um, it doesn't work for some landmark, I think in some it does, just be careful. So I'm just going to draw it over here so you can see what I've got. This is my framing member, the width is going to be six inches wide, and the height is going to be, I just need to check back. Uh, what my height was, I think it was about eight inches. Just going back to my sketch. Uh, sketch I've got is yeah, about eight inches. Okay, so it's eight inches high, and it's a solid beam, and let's click OK. Now the the presentation, the presentation view of that framing member is what Vectorworks calls solid, but that's not what I think of solid. The one I like is the one called display, not solid. I like width, so it shows the entire width of that, that object. So let's drag it and put it there, but what you'll find is the elevation's wrong. That should be 7 feet 4 inches. At the moment, we can't make that object link to a level. Be really cool in the future if we could. And there it is. But you might notice that my seven feet four inches is to the top of my beam, not to the underside. We have a vertical reference we can control. We want that to be to the bottom of the beam. We want it to move the beam up. We're going to give that the same beach texture. I've now got a a beam, I can use my mirror tool, and I find this, the mirror, middle of the wall. Now the trick with finding the middle of the wall is that there's a tiny little grey mark right in the midpoint of that wall, right there. Hold down the shift key, I've mirrored that. Another framing member, this time my framing member is going to be a little thinner. I'm not sure how long I want, I want about that long, I just really I don't want to do too much measuring on that. So that needs to be width. We know this vertical reference needs to be the bottom of it. We know this needs to be 7 feet 4 inches, plus we made the other one 8 inches, plus 8 inches. So it should be 8 feet. So the width is 2 inches, and the height is 6 inches, and that will change that object and we'll give it the same beach texture. So there it is, you can see it's floating up at the right height. Now the question might be, why did you bother drawing it not on top of the walls? Why didn't you just draw it? Well, if I go to that point there, I can find the midpoint of my rafter. If I move to the midpoint of my wall, I can now get the, even, the overhang at each end of my rafter even. It's kind of a lazy way of doing it. I'm sure there's a, a more complicated mathematical way of doing it, um, but to me it's a really quick, easy way to get it the way I want. And I'm not that worried at the moment about what my overhangs are. I just want it to look good. Now I need a whole bunch of them. I'm going to use my Move by Points tool. I'm going to use the Distribute mode. 
I'm going to keep the original. And I need about oh, 14, 15 of these. Let's make it 15 copies. So starting at the bottom of that rafter there, or the right side of that rafter, click, come down till you line up with the bottom of that beam, and it creates all my duplicates. So that's not bad for a starter, is it? We've got pretty much our design underway. So now I guess what we need is some quick drawings. A quick drawing would be really cool. So have we got a way of making some really quick drawings? View, let's create some multiple viewports, and we're going to do 30 angle projection, front, Cool, that's my elevation. Top, that's my plan. Right, that's my other elevation. And we're done. If we used classes, it would be really easy for me to show you how to create multiple drawings. But what I'm going to do is go back to my design layer because I want to make a perspective view. Now, some people don't like using the camera tool. It's my preference. Some people like using the flyover tool to do it instead. They use the uh, flyover tool to get the to get the perspective they want. They use the walkthrough tool to walk into it, and they use the flyover tool, as I said, to move around. Great. If you like that method, that's fantastic. I just prefer using the camera. So the camera tool, click there to, for the camera position, click for where I'm looking. My camera height, eye height's about five feet. I'm going to activate the camera and we'll see what it looks like. So that's my view. I think it might be okay. But we'll activate the camera and check. So that's my camera view. Now, one of the things that comes up with the camera in 2016 is that if you start moving your view, the camera moves. Yes, it does. So deactivate the camera after you've placed it or after you've moved it. Otherwise, it will continue to move as you move the view. You can always fine tune the camera view. So we can change the camera height. We can change the look to height. We can pan the camera. We can move the camera until you get the view you want. And then click OK. So I've got a camera. I can make that into a viewport. And when I make it into a viewport, it will take the camera object and bind it into our viewport. Now, once I bind this into the viewport, I won't see this. Uh, let's make a uh, render work style. I'll just make it OpenGL for the time being. Once I bind the camera into the viewport, you can edit the camera location through the viewport, but you won't see the camera on the design layer any longer. So let's have a look. I just want to drag that over here. Jonathan, can you set the camera from using the other tools and then say set camera there for detailed changes? Yes, are you, yeah, can you set the view and then make a camera from that view? You can. I think that was new in 2016, so you can, um, if, I, if I place a camera, leave the camera selected, it's not activated, then I can change my view, uh, we'll walk into that I think. Oh, this wasn't my walkthrough tool. That one. And then you can go, there's a button here, Barbara, match current view. So that should have moved the camera to match that view. And see the camera's moved. So when you activate okay. the camera, it changes to that view. Yeah, David says by using the walkthrough when flyover, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Cool. But sometimes it, it's it's quick just to use the camera. So if I go back to my if I go back to my um, sheet layer, so that's the camera view that I've already got. I'll make a copy of that. Right click and let's edit the camera, and it takes me back to my design layer, and so I can see where my camera was, and I can see my design, and I can move that camera to a new location, then return back to my viewport. And for me, so other people like other methods, I understand that, but for me I find it really quick to set up a whole lot of perspectives of a project by duplicating the viewport and then editing the camera. So, does anyone have questions about this? No, so no, Barbara? Just, just feedback, yeah, they say it makes sense. Okay, so we've created our drawings. So at this Actually, point... Sorry, <laughs> just one popped right up. Um, what about saved view, saved view, same thing? <clears throat> what do I mean by same thing? Uh, what about saved views? Well, you can use, I'm assuming they're talking about using the camera. Yes, same as or, camera view. Or are they, talking about, are they talking about using saved views instead of using sheet layers? No, I think... Because uh, some people don't like using sheet layers. I think they refer to same thing as camera views. Not quite. Saved view is often used, um, it can, it can replicate a view, but the problem with the saved view uh, that is makes it less efficient than the camera is that if you want to change the saved view, then you've got to use your tools. You can certainly um, bring a view back. Um, but if you want to make another save view of the same sort, then you've got to change your view round. You've got to move your view. But the save view doesn't put the picture of that project onto your sheet layer. So sure, you can use a save view and it'll restore a view. Um, but I... I, I, I guess I used to use it, Barbara but I don't use it anymore. One of, the, one of the reasons I don't use it, if we go back to our design layer, I think I've deleted my camera view. So if I put a camera view back in, I've got a camera view there, I've got another one here, another one there. So I've got a big project with all these camera views. You might find it a hassle double clicking on these camera views or finding them. But what about using our visualization palette and using it to activate a camera? This is a lot quicker than using a save view, I think. Um, but that's just my personal take on it. Sure, you can use a save view to replicate some of those views, but the save view might also uh, store the class information uh, or the, the rendering style, which we can also do on the camera. It's, there's no great advantage, I think, using the camera Barbara, but I just, I kind of like the ability that you can just grab it from here um, and it becomes like a saved view palette. Okay, fair enough. So we look at our camera views here, we find that, what that what's that, there's one viewport which is massive, oh I know what it is. Okay, so we come here we find that there's a too much of a view, we could edit our camera, but we can also just use our clip tool and clip the bit that we really want to keep. So I just only want to see that. And this one, I only want to see a small amount of that as well. So I've just changed the, the crop area of those viewports by using the clip tool on them, which I think is kind of a cool trick. Update those, and there's the views. I haven't got labels on here, I haven't got a title block yet, so I can go ahead and put those on. I'm going to make a viewport from that as well. That hasn't got a crop, so I'm going to make sure that's got a crop. And then I can label it, put dimensions on it, I can use classes to turn off the roof framing, and so on. 
So has anyone got a, an issue with that so far, Barbara? No. Okay, so these ones, maybe on these ones we need to see the foundation as well. And again, I'm going to clip just the bits that I want. Better make sure I haven't got both those selected. So good so far. Well, so far so good. So let's go back to our floor. Let's turn on our foundation. So navigation palettes, turn that on. Show snap others. So I can see all our foundations there now. We can use our clip cube. Now this works much better if you change to an a OpenGL view, I think. And let's pull that in there. And so now what I've got is a clip through my building. I haven't got a slab, I need to put a slab in obviously, but I'm going to make a section for that. So select my clip cube, highlight that face, right click, let's create a section viewport, and that's 1 to 50 I think, and there it is there. So it's not going to be perspective, it's orthogonal, and there's my section through the building. See it at my annotations because what I'd like to do is put a detail in here. And view, create detail viewport, and that's going to be at a scale of say 1 to 10 or 1 to 20. Let me just have a look. That's 1 to 10, too big, 1 to 20. And that detail relates to this object here, and if I move that detail, if I renumber it, or if I move it to a different sheet layer, this reference will update. So I'm going to go and make my slab. I only want to see one design layer, this one. And I'm going to create my slab object. If I've got a slab from my library, I can reuse that. I thought I had one which was a slab on grade, there's one. And I can also use it by picking walls. So I pick my four walls and my slab should bind to those walls. Now if I've set my slab up correctly, it will bound to the edges of those walls. And it looks to me like I've made it a something wrong with that, where it's not bound to the walls properly, it's overhanging a wee bit, and it might be that I've um, got a setting wrong. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and let's go back to our drawing, and let's have a look to make sure everything's arrived. And it might be in cases like this, you have to check the classes, because new classes may have arrived. And so there's my slab is now part of my design. So as I change my design, as I update my design, my drawings are updating automatically. Let's go back to that, delete that slab. I'm going to draw the slab manually this time. So it's exactly the right size. Oh, I know what I did. I picked the wrong walls. Let's go back to an isometric view. I picked those outside walls there. Aha. Because they're not on their own class and Let's do the slab again. This time I'm going to do it in a 3D view. So that wall, that wall, that wall, and that wall. Now my slab fits perfectly. Ah, right. 
If I use classes on my foundation, so I could have these uh, looking a specific in a specific way, and I could have these looking in a specific color, line weight, so on. I could actually make my drawings much more graphic than I have at the moment. So I'm just having a look through the notes, Barbara. I've just about covered everything except putting in some furniture and making a change. Are there any questions so far? No. Okay. So that's my flyover tool. Let's just put in some furniture, put on a table and chairs. Don't want my clip cube turned on. And maybe we decide, uh, well, let's put in some base cabinets because the client's thinking that, um, now just be careful here, it's trying to snap into the wall. Let's turn off my wall insertion mode. Maybe we've got an outdoor kitchen type situation. And when we put that in, we realize we haven't got enough room. So we're supposed to have an outdoor kitchen. Uh, there isn't really enough room for it. So we need to extend everything. So I could select all of those objects there. I could extend those. Let me just select all my framing members. It's selecting a whole lot of stuff. I don't want it to like the camera, so I'm going to delete those. If they were in a class, it would be good to turn those off. And I really want to just stretch those out a wee bit. So we want to go out. What do we need to do? So let's make them. I'm thinking that we need to add what, about a foot. So I've moved that a foot. I can move these a foot, so I can use my move command. And I also need to move on my walls. Now this is the time where you really need to have these objects on classes so that you can turn some of the things on or off. So if you've got classes that you can import, by all means import them. So we've got one here called Furniture Equipment, uh, Equipment Main, I'll use that one. Because then I can use my visibility tool and I can hide those objects. Just like these rafters here, I might want to select those rafters and put all those rafters on a class. Structural, I've only got slab on grade for that, so let's go and make some framing. I think I've got one I use called Structural Rafters. This. I don't want to edit the properties. OK. And then I can hide those. So now what I want to do is I want to move my floor and my foundations. And I want to move everything in this area. And a really good way of doing it, select everything that you need to move. Use the reshape tool and drag a marquee around everything that needs to move. Use your move command and it's moved my slab, it's moved my foundation walls, it's moved my screen walls, it's moved everything. Even the beams. And let's go back to our drawings. Now if the drawings have updated, then everything's perfect. Here you might notice that some information is missing. If we look at classes, my structural slab's gone missing. So I can put that back. Uh, we might find that the rafters have gone missing. And if we put all those back, do you notice my rafters have got that magenta or that pink color? But what I could do is I could change the graphic style of those, make them none, make them a light gray color, and maybe even make them a solid line type. So now, regardless of the design layer style, my viewports can be the style that I want. Jonathan, since you turn off your framing class, did they stretch with the beams floor? They didn't. Okay. Because they were turned off. Okay. 
So I've done the section viewport, I've done the detail viewport, I've done everything from the handout, Barbara. Yeah, I uh, there's a request if if it's okay with you. Uh, can you review that clip cube? Um, David David says I've never seen that, and uh, where is that tool? So let's go back. So in my design layer, there's a quick preference called show clip cube. These quick preferences here. This is the quick preference area. These quick preferences are controlled by this uh, utility menu. And you can choose which, which preferences you want to see there. And one of the preferences that I've got is show clip cube. Now the clip cube is somewhere else, and I forget where it is, but it's somewhere like uh, view or edit. Um, I thought it was under view somewhere. It's like show clip cube, something like that. Oh, there it is. I see it. That's where it is, David. Clip cube. Um, but this is a quick preference. And the beauty of this is that if I turn on, let's turn on all my classes. So they're all turned on now. If I select an object like the tables and chairs and then I say show clip cube, it'll just focus me around the objects I've got selected. If I select a wall or a column and I show the clip cube, you can just see the area you've got selected. And if nothing is selected, it goes around everything in the file, including this um, section line. So the clip cube, once you select it, you can move to a face, it'll turn red, click and then move. Click, move and then click to stop. which is kind of cool. And let's just fly around. You might notice that with my classes, my structural classes, the rafters have got no fill. So let's edit those. We really want them to be solid. I don't like them in that magenta color and I want them to be solid with a line. So David, does that answer your question about the clip cube? Yes, it does. He thanks so you. once you've got the once you've got the clip cube, you can then select a face and go create section viewport. And VectorX will use the settings of the clip cube, so the width, the height, the depth, to control your section viewport. You can also do fun things like a part section like this, and then create a section viewport from the plan view. So if you've got a complex building that doesn't suit top plan very well, don't forget you can use the clip cube to generate that as well. What other questions have we got, Barbara? That's it. There's no other questions, so we can leave it open oh, for a couple of wonderful. seconds and see if anybody comes up with last minute question. But otherwise, we I think um, they're all pretty satisfied. And there's great feedback throughout, so... Cool. Well, don't forget, cool. guys, a lot of the stuff that I've covered, I don't know if anyone's, anyone noticed, but the, the manual that I covered just before is one of my monthly manuals that, I, uh, that my subscribers get, and these are the manuals we've covered so far this year. So the 2D to BIM, the Enegos subdivision modeling, how to do building takeoffs, outdoor lighting was a lot of fun. Uh, lots of people enjoyed that one. So every month we get a new manual. That's but you have great. to be a subscriber. Yeah, yeah. So please tell everybody where they should go if they want uh, this quality of training. They should go to my website. Yeah, show show it off. So, so this is my website, arconcad.com. It starts out. If you have a look, it's got a, an advertising page where you can look at uh, you can look and see what we've. Uh, about me, about my site, you can learn more about me, you can subscribe now, and every month we have a new manual, we have online sessions for architects, landscapers, there we are, uh, interactive workshops, we, we cover these sessions and workshops. Uh, this week we've been having special interest groups for architects and landscapers, 
So this is what we did the other day. We looked at detailing. So that someone wanted to look at the, the detail of how do we put together details on a drawing, how do we create these references, how do we link those references back to um, our actual viewport details. And we've also got a great one, a new one called Getting Started, where we start to just cover things from a very basic way so that people that are, you know, lots of people know Vectorworks very well, but some people, I've never gotten into the 3D. Well, let's have a look at how we do it. And you might recognize this, Barbara. Uh, it came up in one of the sessions, yeah. and that gave us the idea to create this webinar and the manual that goes with it. Yeah. So people just needed to know, how do I connect these things together? I, I just don't see the connection. Yeah. And cool. if you're getting started from scratch with Vectorworks, I'd like you to have a look at my courses. So these courses contain many movies in a structured way to learn specific parts of Vectorworks. So if you're a beginner, complete beginner to Vectorworks, have a look at my Vectorworks Essentials course. And if you're an architect, then you'll get a lot of really valuable information from the architect course, and it'll back up a lot of what I've talked about today. The design layers, the stories, the levels, how does stories and levels work with my wall styles, how does my wall style work with other things. Uh, I didn't get into it today, but it, it, that manual also covers, well that course also covers the framing member and how to make your own customized framing objects. What do you have for interior designers, Jonathan? Thoughts, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but in, um, I think, November, we're going to be looking at Vectorworks for interior design. It might lead on to a course, but if you're an interior designer, you should be doing something like the Vectorworks Essentials in the 3D modeling course, because so much of what you want to do is not yet created as an object. So if you want to create some unusual furniture, that Vectorworks doesn't have an unusual furniture object. You've got to make it. And how do you make it? Well, you need to um, learn how to apply some of these techniques. I think we did it a couple of weeks ago in our 3D modeling group. We did some um, design. The 3D modeling often goes into either complex landscaping or interior design. So doing bars and furniture we've done in the 3D modeling sessions. But my suggestion is that if, if you're brand new to Vectorworks, you should always start with the essentials before you become a subscriber. It'll just give you such a great foundation. Awesome. Um, now, I don't know when the new version of Vectorworks is coming out. There's a new version called Vectorworks 2017. I don't know when it's coming out. I honestly don't. I'm not just kidding people. But We can guess I, sometimes in well, mid-September. Yeah. But in mid-September, have a look at this page, have a look at these courses page because my new courses will be there. Fantastic. So I've finished my architect for 2017. I've finished my essentials for 2017. I'm working on the landscape one, which is going to look at um, a more commercial project. And I've started the 3D modeling one as well. OK, so you know what? Uh, David would say in that he designs lights, light fixtures with vector works, in fact. so. Cool. Pretty cool. So the 3D modeling sweeps, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Looks like uh, the perfect tool. Okay, Jonathan, that that was great. Thanks for walking us through your site and uh, you know show a little bit of uh, what's offered there. I I always uh, you know when somebody asks me you know after works uh, you know do you have any trainers you know I um, I speak highly of you. So Thank check you. it out. Yeah, I Check will. Check out my site, absolutely. Yeah. There's um, someone said that there must be a ton of movies here, Barbara. Last time I counted, it was two and a half thousand. Wow. Oh my gosh. Which I figure is a ton. Wow. It's like Bollywood in there. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I had to take the screen back. I didn't plan on it, um, you know, uh, disappointing anyone. I know yours was much better. But I, I want to thank everybody for being so flexible and patient and visit us again today. And, I'm um, really sorry. I'm yeah, stopped. thank you. And uh, I want to remind everyone to visit our page at noveg.com where you can find the entire line of Vectorworks products. 
Novedge is the best way to design software online and you'll find the, the best prices. Just, you know, talk to us on the phone. We have the best quotes uh, guaranteed. And for information on the la latest specials and new releases, join the Novedge network on Facebook, Google Plus or Twitter. And don't forget that next week's webinar is about V-Ray for Moto. Also to rewatch today's webinar or previous ones, uh, check out our Noveg YouTube and Vimeo channels. Our webinar playlist has webinar for every software taste and there's 210 as of today. Thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful day and thanks Jonathan. Um, great, great job. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Barbara. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.